Ed Rude, we're back talking to you about properties of definite integrals. Another question, what do you do with a sick wasp? You take them to the hospital. <laughs> now let's talk about two special definite integrals. The first one says if f is defined at x is equal to a, then the integral from a to a of f of x dx equals zero. So anytime your lower limit of integration and your upper limit of integration are the same exact number, that integral of your function times dx is equal to zero. And it makes sense because you're calculating the area under this function from some x value to the same exact x value. That means there's no area under the curve, so it has to equal zero. The second special definite integral says if f is integrable on the closed interval from a to b, then the integral from b to a of f of x dx is equal to the negative integral from a to b of f of x dx. So what this is saying is that if you were to switch your lower and upper limits of integration in a particular integral, then you're going to have to put a negative sign out front of your integral. Now this usually occurs when your lower limit of integration is greater than your upper limit of integration, like b would be equal to 5 and a would be equal to 0. But since you can't integrate backwards, you can't go from x is equal to 5 to x is equal to 0, what you have to do is you have to flip your limits of integration. And when you do that, you put a negative sign out front of your integral. Now let's talk about the additive interval property. This says if f is integrable on the three closed intervals determined by a, b, and c, then the integral from a to b of f of x dx is equal to the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b of f of x dx. So what this is saying is, let's say you have an interval from a to b, and c is somewhere in between a and b. If you take the integral from a to b of f of x dx, meaning you're finding the area under the curve of this function on this given interval from a to b, it would be equal to the integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from c to b, meaning you could add up those two areas under the curve to equal the entire area under the curve on this interval. Now let's talk about the properties of definite integrals. This says if f and g are integrable on the closed interval from a to b and k is a constant, then the functions k times f and f plus or minus g are integrable on the closed interval from a to b and the integral from a to b of k times f of x dx is equal to k times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So what this is saying is that if you have a constant being multiplied to a function and you want to take the integral from a to b of of that particular constant multiplied to your function, what you could do instead is you could take that constant, move it out front of the integral sign, and just integrate that function, then multiply the constant on afterwards, just like the constant multiple rule when we were dealing with derivatives. Down here, what this is saying is if you are taking the integral from a to b of a function plus or minus another function, or a function that has multiple terms in it, what you can do is you can take the integral of each term separately. That's what this is telling you you're allowed to do. What did the bees do after they got married? Went on their honeymoon! It's example time! Now example one says evaluate each definite integral. So here we have the integral from pi to pi of sine of x dx. Now if you recall, if your lower limit of integration and your upper limit of integration are the same exact number, that means that your integral is going to be equal to zero. And that's it, you're done. Part B, we have the integral from 2 to 0 of 2x plus 1 dx. Now note, in this particular integral, your lower limit of integration is greater than your upper limit of integration. And since we can't integrate backwards, what we have to do is we have to switch our lower and upper limit of integration. And when we do that, if you recall, we have to put a negative sign out front of our integral. Now we can evaluate this integral. Now because we haven't learned the fundamental theorem of calculus yet, the way we're going to evaluate this integral is graphically. We're going to find the exact area under the curve using a geometric formula. So how would we graph this particular function? Well, y is equal to 2x plus 1. That's a linear function where we have a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 2. So if we were to graph that, it would look like this. Then we just shade under the curve from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 2. That would be this pink region right here. So now all we have to do is find the exact area of this region using a geometric formula. Well, what geometric shape is this? Well, it's actually going to be a trapezoid that's been tilted on its back. 
Now, what is the area of a trapezoid formula? That would be area is equal to one half the sum of the bases times the height. Now, if you recall, I said the trapezoid has been tilted on its back, meaning that this would be one of the bases, one unit, and this would be the other base, which is five units. The height is going to be the distance between the two bases, which would be two units. So we plug those in, we simplify. One plus five is six. Multiply that to the one half, you end up getting three. Multiply that to the two, you end up getting six units squared. That would be the area under the curve from x is equal to zero to x is equal to two. However, that's just what we get when we evaluate this integral. We also had this negative sign out front. So we have to tack on a negative to our six and we end up getting that this integral right here is equal to negative six. What do you call the Andrew who likes math? An accountant. He'll try. Now part eight wants you to evaluate the integral from negative one to one of the absolute value of x dx. Now in the coming lessons, we're gonna learn the fundamental theorem of calculus, which will allow us to evaluate this analytically. But the way we're gonna evaluate this right now is graphically. We are gonna graph the function y is equal to the absolute value of x. Now what does that look like? Absolute value functions are V-shaped graphs. They have sharp turns. They have corners at whatever x values cause this in here to equal zero. So what x value would cause this in here to equal zero? That's zero. So we're gonna have a sharp turn, a corner, at x is equal to zero. Now, our integral is from negative one to one, so we're going to shade anywhere between the function and the x-axis going from x is equal to negative one to x is equal to positive one. So all we have to do then is calculate the area of this triangle, calculate the area of this triangle, add up those two areas, and we will have evaluated this integral. But what I want you to note is that an absolute value function is technically a piecewise function, where this function is going to equal x anywhere where x is greater than or equal to zero. This function is going to equal the opposite of x, that's where the absolute value comes in, anywhere where x is less than zero. That's why there's two parts of this graph. y is equal to negative x, the opposite of x, when x is less than zero, and y is equal to positive x, anywhere where x is greater than or equal to zero. So that's why you can technically rewrite this integral as two separate integrals added together. The integral from negative one to zero of negative x dx, plus the integral from zero to one of x dx. Now, you don't necessarily need this for right now. All you need to do is just calculate the area of these two triangles. So what's the area formula of a triangle? That would be one half base times height. And in our first triangle, we have a base of one and a height of one. In our other triangle, same thing. We have a base of one and a height of one. So when we plug those in and we simplify, we end up getting that this total area down here would be one unit squared or one square unit. So this particular integral, if we were to evaluate it, would be equal to one. Part B, we have the integral from four to zero of x plus three dx. Again, our lower limit of integration is greater than our upper limit of integration. And because we can't integrate backwards, what we have to do is we have to switch our lower and upper limit of integration. So we're gonna flip those two numbers. And when we do that, we have to put a negative sign out front of our integral. Now what we can do is we can evaluate this integral and then just tack on a negative at the end. So how would we evaluate this integral? Well, since this in here is a linear function, we can just graph that line and then shade under the curve from x is equal to zero to x is equal to four. So how would we graph y is equal to x plus three? Well, this is a linear function with a slope of one and a y-intercept at three. And then we shade under the curve, like we said, from x is equal to zero to x is equal to four. Now all we have to do is find the area of this region. So this looks like a trapezoid again that's tilted on its back. So we're going to use the area of a trapezoid formula. Area is equal to one half the sum of the bases times the height. Again, it's tilted on its back, meaning that this would be one of the bases over here, three units. This would be the other other base with seven units and the height is the distance between the two bases so that would be four units when we simplify this we have to add in here first three plus seven is ten multiply that to the one half you get five multiply that to the four you get 20 units squared so we can say that this integral right here is equal to 20 but then we have to tack on that negative that we had because we switched our limits of integration so this particular integral out here would be equal to negative 20. Now example two says evaluate the given integral using each of the following values. So we have the values down here of three separate integrals, but we are evaluating this one right here. So how would we evaluate this? Well, if you recall, any time that you have a function in here with multiple terms and you're evaluating that integral, definite or indefinite, what you can do is you can take the integral of each term separately. Remember to tack on a dx to each of those integrals. Now what we can do is we look up here and we say, oh, I see the integral from one to three of x squared 
squared dx. That's equal to 26 over 3. So the integral from 1 to 3 of x squared dx, I can plug in 26 over 3 here. For this integral, the integral from 1 to 3 of x dx, I see that that is equal to 4. So I can take a 4, plug that in here. Lastly, I have the integral from 1 to 3 of 3 dx. Oh, that's not what this is equal to. Well, what I could do is take this 3, since it's just a constant, and move it out front of the integral sign. Now I see that I have the integral from 1 to 3 of just dx, and that is equal to 2. So I'm going to take that 2 and plug it in here. Now all I have to do is simplify this, and I end up getting that this integral right here is equal to 56 over 3. For b, doing the same thing. Because I'm taking the integral from 1 to 3 of a function with multiple terms, I can take the integral of each term separately. Remember to tack on a dx to the end of each of those integrals. Here, I have the integral from 1 to 3 of negative x squared dx. I look up here. Oh, this is just the integral from 1 to 3 of x squared dx. Well, remember, this negative sign out front is just negative 1 times x squared. So I can actually just take that negative and move it out front of the integral sign. And now I will have the integral from 1 to 3 of x squared dx. X. Same thing here. I have this 5 multiplied to x dx. So I can take that constant, move it out front of the integral sign, and then I can use this particular integral. Same thing here. I have this negative 6 times dx. I can take that negative 6, move it out front of my integral sign, and now I have the integral from 1 to 3 of dx. So I can plug in what each of these integrals is equal to down here, and I can simplify. And when I do, I end up getting that this definite integral is equal to negative 2 thirds. What do you call an ant who's a big deal? Important! You try! Part 8, I have the integral from 2 to 4 of 25 dx. Now, is 25 dx up here? No, but we do have the integral from 2 to 4 of just dx. So what I can do is I can take this constant, 25, move it out front of the integral sign, and now I can plug in what the integral from 2 to 4 dx is equal to, 2. So if I plug in 2 for the integral from 2 to 4 dx, I just simplify and I end up getting 50. Over here, if I want to evaluate the integral from 2 to 4 of 2x cubed minus 4 dx, again, I have a function with multiple multiple terms, so I can take the integral of each term separately. Remember to tack on a dx to the end of each of those integrals. Now what I can do is evaluate each of these integrals separately. Here, I'm taking the integral from 2 to 4 of 2x cubed dx. Is that up here? No, but I do have x cubed dx. So what I can do is take this 2 and move it out front of the integral sign. Same thing here. I don't have the integral from 2 to 4 of negative 4 dx up here, but I do have the integral from 2 to 4 dx. So what I can do is take that negative 4, that's just a constant, and move it out front of the integral sign. Now I can plug in what each of these integrals are equal to. This integral right here is equal to 60, so I plug that in here. This integral right here is equal to 2, so I can plug that in there. I simplify and end up getting that this definite integral is equal to 112. Now example 3 says use the table of values to estimate the integral from 0 to 6 of f of x dx. Use three equal sub intervals and the specified endpoints. Is your answer an over or under estimate? So we're going to start by using a left endpoint estimate. Now because we are estimating the integral from 0 to 6 of f of x dx, we're estimating the area under this function from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 6. And since we're using a left endpoint estimate or left endpoint approximation, we're doing it with rectangles. So how many different rectangles are we going to use to approximate this area under the curve? Well, it says we need three equal sub intervals, meaning we're going to have three different rectangles. So the question is, what is the base of each of those rectangles? What is delta x? Well, since we are breaking up the interval from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 6 into three equal sub intervals, we're going to go from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 2, then x is equal to 2 to x is equal to 4, then x is equal to 4 to x is equal to 6. So delta x, the base of each rectangle, is going to be two units long. We can then rewrite this integral from 0 to 6 of f of x dx as the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx plus the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx plus the integral from 4 to 6 of f of x dx. Now, why do we do that? Because I want to show you that we're going to approximate each of these integrals right here with rectangles. And the area of those rectangles, remember, is going to be base times height. The base we've already figured out for each of those rectangles is 2. That's our delta x here. The height of each of these rectangles is going to be determined based on the left endpoint of those given intervals. So our first interval is from 0 to 2. The height of that rectangle is going to be based on whatever the y value is that corresponds with your left endpoint of that interval. So in this particular instance, the y value that corresponds with the left x value in that given interval is negative 4. So we're going to plug in negative 4 for the height of our first rectangle. The height of our second rectangle going from 2 to 4. We're going to use the y value that corresponds with the left endpoint, which would be 6. So we're going to plug in 6 for the height in our second rectangle. The height of our third rectangle, we're going to use the y value that 
corresponds with the left endpoint, which would be 24. So that goes in for the height of our third rectangle. Remember, the base is 2 for each of those. So now all we have to do is multiply these together, add them up, and we get that our left endpoint estimate of the integral from 0 to 6 of f of x dx is 52. We then have to determine if this is an over or an under estimate. To do that, we have to figure out, is this function increasing or decreasing on this given interval? Well, we look at the y values. The y values are increasing, meaning this left endpoint estimate or left endpoint approximation is going to be an underestimate. For B, we're now doing a right endpoint estimate, meaning everything is going to be the exact same. The base of each of those rectangles is going to be the exact same. The way we're going to break up this definite integral is going to be the exact same. We're going to still use the area formula for three different rectangles and add them together. The only difference is now, instead of determining the height of each of those rectangles with the y value that corresponds with the left endpoint, we're going to use the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint of each interval. So our first interval is from 0 to 2, meaning our rectangle is going to have a base of 2 but the height of this rectangle is now going to be the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint of that interval, which is 6. So that's going to go in here. Our second rectangle is again going to have a base of 2, and the height is going to be the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint, which is 24. That's going to go in here. Our third rectangle again is going to have a base of 2, and the height is going to be the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint, which is 40. So we plug that in here. We then simplify, and we end up getting that the right endpoint estimate of this definite integral right here is 140. Again, we have to determine, is this an over and under estimate? Well, since the function is increasing on this given interval and we're using a right endpoint estimate, we know that this must be an overestimate. Part C, we're now going to do a midpoint estimate. And the way we set this up is the exact same way. The base of each rectangle is still going to be 2. That's going to be the length of each of our sub intervals. We're still going to break up this definite integral from 0 to 2, from 2 to 4, and from 4 to 6. We're still going to find the area of three rectangles and add them together. The base of each of those rectangles is still going to be 2. The only difference is now we're going to determine the height of each of those rectangles based on the y value that corresponds with the midpoint midpoint of our interval. So our first interval is from 0 to 2, meaning our rectangle is going to have a base of 2, and the height is going to be the y value that corresponds with the midpoint of our given interval, meaning it's going to be 0 in this case. So we're going to plug that in for the height here. Our second rectangle is, again, going to have a base of 2, and the height is going to be the y value that corresponds with the midpoint of our given interval, which would be 14 in this case. So we're going to plug that in here. And then for our last rectangle, we are again going to have a base of 2, and the height is going to be the y value that corresponds with the midpoint of that interval which would be 36. So that's going to go in here. We then simplify and we end up getting that the midpoint estimate or midpoint approximation of this definite integral is 100. Now we have to determine whether this is an over or an under estimate. What we have to determine is this function concave up or concave down on this given interval because we're using a midpoint approximation. Well, we look at the y values and we see that they're increasing by 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 on this given interval, meaning they're increasing exponentially, meaning that this function is concave up on this given interval. Therefore, this midpoint approximation would have to be an underestimate. Why don't anteaters get sick? Because they're full of antibodies. You try. Okay, doing the same thing here, except this time we're estimating the integral from 0 to 8 of f of x dx, and we're using four equal sub intervals. So let's start with our left endpoint estimate. Remember, we're using a left endpoint approximation with four equal sub intervals, meaning we're approximating the area under the curve of this function from 0 to 8 using four different rectangles. So we first need to figure out what is going to be the base of each of those rectangles. What's our delta x? Well, since we're going from 0 to 8 and we're using four equal sub intervals, that means the base of each rectangle should again again be 2. So that's the length of each sub interval. Based on that, we can now break up our definite integral up here into the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx plus the integral from 2 to 4 of f of x dx plus the integral from 4 to 6 of f of x dx plus the integral from 6 to 8 of f of x dx. Now we can approximate each of these definite integrals using the area of a rectangle formula. Because we already know the base of each of those rectangles, we just have to figure out what the height of each of these rectangles is going to be. Remember, we're using a left endpoint estimate or left endpoint point approximation, meaning we look at our first sub interval from 0 to 2, and we are going to use the y value that corresponds with the left endpoint of that interval, which would be 55 in this case. So in our first rectangle, we're going to plug in a height of 55. For our second rectangle, we again have a base of 2, and the height is going to correspond with the y value of our left endpoint, which would be 44. So we plug that in here. Our next rectangle again has a base of 2, and the height is going to be the y value that corresponds with our left endpoint, which is 22. That goes in here. Our last rectangle again 
again has a base of 2, and the height is going to correspond with the y value of our left endpoint, which is negative 12. That goes in here. We then simplify, and we end up getting that our left endpoint estimate, or left endpoint approximation of this definite integral, is 218. We then have to determine if this is an over or an under estimate. To do that, we have to figure out, is this function increasing or decreasing on this given interval? Well, judging by the y values, it looks like it's decreasing on this given interval, meaning this left endpoint estimate, or left endpoint approximation, is going to be an over estimate. Next, we're going to do our right endpoint estimate or right endpoint approximation. Now, remember, everything works the exact same way. The only difference now is that the height of each rectangle is going to be different, meaning that our delta x, the length of each subinterval, is going to be the exact same. Our definite integral, we still break up the exact same way. We're still finding the area of four rectangles to approximate each of those definite integrals. Our base of each of those rectangles is still going to be 2. The height this time, we're going to use the right endpoint estimate, meaning on our first subinterval from 0 to 2, we're going to use the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint, which would be 44. That goes in here. On our next subinterval from 2 to 4, we're going to use the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint, which would be 22. That goes in here. On our next subinterval from 4 to 6, we're going to use the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint. That's negative 12. That goes in here. And for our last subinterval from 6 to 8, we're going to use the y value that corresponds with our right endpoint, which would be negative 54. We then simplify and we end up getting that our right endpoint estimate or right endpoint approximation of this given definite integral is equal to 0. Now we have to decide what whether this is an over or under estimate. Well, because the function is decreasing on this given interval and we're using a right endpoint approximation, this is going to be an under estimate. Lastly, we're doing the same thing with a midpoint estimate or a midpoint approximation. The length of each subinterval is the exact same. We're still going to break up our definite integral the same exact way. We're still going to approximate each definite integral using a rectangle. And the base of each of those rectangles is still going to be 2. The only difference is going to be the height of each of those rectangles. We get that by using the y value that corresponds with the midpoint of our given subinterval. So from 0 to 2, the y value that corresponds with the midpoint of that subinterval is 50. So that's going to go in here. From 2 to 4, the y value that corresponds with the midpoint of that subinterval is 34. So that's going to be the height of our second rectangle. From 4 to 6, the y value that corresponds with our midpoint is 8. That's going to be the height of our third rectangle. And for our fourth subinterval, from 6 to 8, the y value that corresponds with our midpoint there would be negative 32. That's going to be the height of our fourth rectangle. We then simplify, and we end up getting that the midpoint estimate or midpoint approximation of this definite integral is equal to 120. Now the question is, is this going to be an over or an under estimate? What we have to determine is this function concave up or concave down on this given interval because we're using a midpoint approximation. Well, this function looks like it's decreasing by 5, by 6, by 10, by 12, by 14. So it's decreasing exponentially, meaning it's going to be concave down on this given interval, meaning that this particular midpoint estimate is going to be an overestimate. Now let's talk about continuity implying integrability. So this says if a function f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, then f is integrable on the closed interval from a to b. That is, the integral from a to b of f of x dx exists. So we've talked about this before. As long as your function f of x is continuous on the closed interval from x is equal to a to x is equal to b, meaning there are no discontinuities, there's no asymptotes, there's no holes, there's no jumps on that given interval, then you can calculate the area under the curve of that function from x equal to a to x is equal to b. But today, it's important to note that the converse of this is not true, meaning that there are certain scenarios where you can still integrate a particular function that has a discontinuity on a given interval. And that's what we're going to do right now. So in this particular instance, we are integrating the function f of x dx from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 5. And our function is a piecewise function, where it's equal to negative 2x plus 7 when x is less than or equal to 3, and it's equal to 4 when x is greater than 3. So anytime you are taking the integral of a piecewise function, you need to break it up based on however many parts of that piecewise function there are. Here there are two parts of that piecewise function, so we're going to create two separate integrals. We're going to say that the integral from 0 to 5 of f of x dx is actually equal to the integral from 0 to 3 of negative 2x plus 7 plus the integral from 3 to 5 of 4 dx. Now we have our definite integral rewritten as the sum of two separate definite integrals, which we have said already we're allowed to do. Now again, because we haven't learned the fundamental theorem of calculus yet, the way we're going to evaluate this is by using geometric area formulas. So we're going to graph each of these functions, shade under those functions on those given 
given intervals, and we can find the areas of each of these regions. So let's graph the function y is equal to negative 2x plus 7. It's a linear function with a slope of negative 2 and a y-intercept at 7, and we're going to shade under the curve from 0 to 3. We're also going to graph the horizontal line y is equal to 4 and shade under that curve from x is equal to 3 to x is equal to 5. This is what that particular piecewise function looks like, and this pink region is the area under the curve, meaning that's what this integral is equal to. So we need to find the area of this region, add it to the area of this region, and we will have evaluated this definite integral. So let's use our geometric area formulas. What is this geometric shape? Well, it looks like, again, we have a trapezoid that's been tilted on its back, where this is one of the bases, this is the other base, and the height is the distance between those two bases. Now remember, the area of a trapezoid formula is just one half the sum of the bases times the height. We are then going to add that to the area of this rectangle, and we know the area of a rectangle formula is just base times height. So now, in this particular trapezoid, we said that this was one of the bases, so that would be 7, that goes in here. This was the other base, that's just 1, that goes in here. The height is the distance between the two bases, that would be 1, 2, 3 units, that's going to go in here. In this rectangle, we have a base of 2 units and a height of 4 units, so that's going to go in here. We simplify, and we end up getting that the integral from 0 to 5 of f of x dx, this given piecewise function, is equal to 20. Part B, doing the same thing, except this time we're taking the integral from negative 3 to 3 of a rational function. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to graph this rational function. And this rational function has a vertical asymptote at whatever x value causes its denominator to equal 0. So this is going to have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative 2. Now the issue here is that because there's a vertical asymptote, this area goes on forever in either direction, meaning there's no way to calculate the area between the function and the x-axis on that given interval because of this asymptote. So we can say that the integral from negative 3 to 3 of 1 over x plus 2 dx does not exist. And if you ever have a definite integral that you're trying to evaluate where there's an asymptote on that given interval, you could just say that the integral does not exist. Now part C, we are taking the integral from 0 to 2 of this step function. So how does that work? Now if you recall, this is the parent step function, which is a bunch of little horizontal lines that change at every x value that's an integer. So we start with the horizontal line y is equal to 0 from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 1. Then we have the horizontal line y is equal to 1 from x is equal to 1 to x is equal to 2. Then we have the horizontal line y is equal to 2 from x is equal to 2 to x is equal to 3. So because it breaks up like that, we're going to break this particular integral up into the integral of our step function from 0 to 1 plus the integral of our step function from 1 to 2. That way when we graph it we see that we can now evaluate this integral using geometric area formulas. So this particular integral right here we can see is definitely a rectangle or a square in this case and this one right here well it's not really a rectangle but you can say that it's a rectangle it has a base of 1 and a height of 0. This rectangle right here has a base of 1 and a height of 1 so we can plug each of those in we can simplify and we end up getting that this definite integral up here would be equal to 1. Part D, we're evaluating the integral from 0 to 4 of g of x dx, where g of x is this particular piecewise function. Now we said anytime we're evaluating an integral of a piecewise function, we want to separate this particular integral into however many parts of this piecewise function there are. In this case, there are two parts. So we're going to separate this into the integral from 0 to 2 of negative 3x plus 6, because this is when x is less than or equal to 2. Then we're going to add that to the integral from 2 to 4 of x minus 2, because this is when x is greater than or equal to 2. Now we can evaluate each of these definite integrals separately and add them together. So because we don't know the fundamental theorem of calculus yet, we want to use geometric area formulas to evaluate these integrals. So in this particular instance, we have the function y is equal to negative 3x plus 6. We're going to graph that and then shade under the curve from x is equal to 0 to x is equal to 2. In this particular instance, we have the function y is equal to x minus 2. We're going to graph that function and shade the region under that function from x is equal to 2 to x is equal to 4. We now have these two triangular regions that we can find the area of, add them together, and then we will have evaluated this integral. So we know the area of a triangle formula. In this particular triangle, we have a base of 2 and a height of 6. So we can plug those in over here. In this particular triangle, we have a base of 2 and a height of 2. If we were to simplify this, we end up getting that the integral from 0 to 4 of g of x dx is equal to 8. 
Now, example four says find the x values at which the function is not continuous and evaluate the integral. Use a graphing utility to verify your results. So we're taking the integral from negative 3 to 4 of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1 dx. So the first thing we want to do here is find the x values at which this function is not continuous or has a discontinuity. So initially, it looks like this rational function would have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative 1 because that would cause this denominator to equal 0. But if we look at the numerator a little more closely, we see that this is a difference of squares, which factors into x plus 1 times x minus 1. And the x plus 1s will then cancel each other out, meaning this will not have a vertical asymptote at x is equal to negative 1. Since they cancel out, it will have a hole at x is equal to negative 1. We can then evaluate this integral by doing what we just said. We want to simplify this rational function first. We factor the numerator, that difference of squares, into the quantity x minus 1 times the quantity x plus 1. The x plus 1s cancel each other out, and we're just left with the integral from negative 3 to 4 of x x minus 1 dx. Now to evaluate this definite integral, because we do not know the fundamental theorem of calculus yet, we have to graph this linear function in here and then find the area between the function and the x-axis. So we said it's a linear function, y is equal to x minus 1, with a slope of 1 and a y-intercept at negative 1, with a hole at x is equal to negative 1. So the graph is going to look something like this. Now we need to find the area between the function and the x-axis on the interval from negative 3 to 4. So that's what this looks like. These two triangular regions. The only catch here is that one of the regions is below the x-axis, meaning that its area is going to be negative. Up until this point, we've dealt with all areas above the x-axis. Since we have an area below the x-axis, that area must be negative. So we're going to add together the area of this triangle and the area of this triangle. The only catch is that the area of this triangle is going to be negative. So the base of this triangle is 1, 2, 3, 4 units. The height is 1, 2, 3, 4 units. So we plug that in over here. The base of this triangle is 1, 2, 3 units. The height is 1, 2, 3 units. So we plug that in, we simplify, and we end up getting that the combined area here is going to be negative 3 and a half. Again, because this region right here had to be negative. It was below the x-axis. Now what we're going to do is confirm our answer with a graphing calculator. So in your graphing calculator, the first thing you're going to do is press the math button. You're going to scroll down to 9 and press enter. When you do that, you then plug in your lower limit of integration, your upper limit of integration, then plug in the function. Make sure that your whole numerator is in parentheses, divided by, then make sure your whole denominator is in parentheses. Then at the end, make sure you put dx, press enter, and you end up getting the exact area under the curve of this particular function on this interval is negative 3.5. That checks out. What do you call a man who's fancy? Elegant! You try! Okay, doing the same thing here. So the first thing we want to do is identify the discontinuity. So where is there a discontinuity? Well, if you recall, anytime you have the absolute value of something over that same something, that means we're going to have a jump discontinuity at whatever x value causes this to equal zero. So in this case, that would be at x is equal to zero. There's going to be a jump discontinuity. Now what we need to do is evaluate this integral. Now because there's no easy way to take the integral of an absolute value function, what you're going to have to do is rewrite this using a piecewise function. So in in this function, when x is greater than or equal to zero, the absolute value will not affect the problem. Meaning, we can just say that for all x greater than or equal to zero, this function is just x over x. But when x is less than zero, the absolute value will affect the problem. It'll turn this number up here into the opposite of whatever it is. So, this function is going to be negative x over x when x is less than zero. So, the way we're going to break up this definite integral then is by creating the integral from negative two to zero when x is less than zero. It's going to be negative x over x dx. X. And then we're going to add that to the integral from 0 to 5 when x is greater than or equal to 0. The function is going to be x over x dx. Now what we can do is simplify each of these, and now we can evaluate each of these definite integrals using geometric area formulas. So we're going to graph each of these functions and then find the area of each of those geometric shapes. Well, how do I graph the function y is equal to negative 1? Well, it's just a horizontal line at y is equal to negative 1, and we're doing that from negative 2 to 0. So that's what it's going to look like down here. Over here, we're graphing the function y is equal to 1, which is a horizontal horizontal line from 0 to 5. So that's what this looks like. And we have our jump at x is equal to 0, just like we were talking about earlier. Now we just find the area of each of these rectangles. Don't forget that because this region is below the x-axis, this area needs to be negative. So this rectangle has a base of 2, a height of 1, so we plug that in over here. This rectangle has a base of 5 and a height of 1, so we plug that in over here. We simplify, and we end up getting that the combined area here would equal 3. That is the answer to this definite integral up here.
Now, if we wanted to confirm our answer with a graphing calculator, we would press the math button. We would scroll down to nine. We would enter our lower and upper limits of integration. We would plug in our function. Remember to get the absolute value function. You press the math button and then scroll over to number and it should be the first thing that you see. Plug in this, make sure you put DX at the end, press enter, and you get that your definite integral is equal to 2.9999975566. Wait, but we got three. That's because your calculator uses a different type of calculation in order to evaluate this definite integral. Don't worry, because this is so close, you know that you got the right answer.